On December 1st, 2001, the USA played South Africa in what was kind of a landmark game at the time. The USA played extremely well, led at halftime, and really pushed South Africa in what ended up being a 43-20 result for the Springboks, but really was played a lot closer than that. And it was played in front of 13,000 paying fans, probably about uh, 15,000 or so people all told with comps and everything like that. It was possibly a, a harbinger for big things to come for American rugby. None of that happened because if you look at my little graph here, you'll see that the attendance, there's that 2001 game, dropped down significantly following that. USA Rugby had been sort of uh, mellow about their events leading up to uh, the South Africa game. They generally played their game, they'd move them around, but for the most part, Boxer Stadium in San Francisco was their home and they would draw 3,500 to maybe 5,000 fans, depending on who played. If they played Tonga or Samoa or Fiji, they got a pretty good crowd, and they made a modest profit on most of those games. It wasn't big business, but it also didn't kill them if they uh, lost a few games. They moved on then to think that maybe they could do something bigger, but in 2002, the team wasn't playing superbly well. The venues picked were not very large and in fact things got worse as they went on in 2002. Back down here, this low water mark here is USA versus Uruguay. So World Cup qualifier game plays on a Thursday night at Boxer Stadium. Less than 1500 fans showed up for, to it. You'd think a World Cup qualifier would be a big deal but USA was struggling at the time and maybe the fan base in San Francisco was a little bit jaded They'd seen a lot of rugby, they'd seen a lot of international rugby even, and they weren't certainly paying to get there. So, USA Rugby decided to get into the event business. They got a professional CEO for the first time, a man named Doug Arnott. And one of the attractions for, for the USA Rugby board in getting Arnott in is that Arnott had event experience. He worked at the Winter Olympics. Now, he worked mostly in security there, but he was still heavily involved in how events were put together. And the events got a little bit better. Arnott was a good organizer in a lot of ways. And things started to pick up. We saw 2004, USA against France in Hartford. 2005, USA against Wales in Hartford. Great game for the USA against France. Terrible game against Wales. Didn't matter. More people came to see the Wales game. And while the USA rugby didn't really make a lot of money out of it, uh, they started to get slightly better attendance. But at the same time, they were making a separate decision on the USA 7s. The USA 7s had been part of this idea, we're going to be a big event company. And they started the USA 7s in 2004 at what was then called Home Depot Center, which is now called Dignity Health Sports Park in Carson, California. Not a lot of fans. The next year, not a lot of fans. 2005, they lost $750,000 in that event, turned around and made a pretty smart decision, which was to sell the rights to the USA 7s to a company that eventually became United World Sports. So USA Rugby decides on the seventh side they're going to sell an event, let a professional run it, and just take a rights fee, which is what they did every year. They were supposed to take also a portion of profits, but officially United World Sports never made a profit on that event. Um, that's another topic, another discussion for another time. Let's go back to the U.S. Men's National 15s team and their home games. And you see what happens here is that they have a few pretty good games. They're, they're getting up there into the 8, 9, 10,000 uh, seat uh, range. Um, some of those games were at Toyota Park in uh, Chicago. And it's interesting to note who they played to get those attendance. This, this one right here, 2007. That's Munster. They didn't even have a test match. They ended up playing Munster, and that was actually an interesting lesson about the kinds of opponents who draw crowds. So over the time, you'll see that the attendance goes up and down and up and down, and a number of lessons come uh, here from how to put on events and who shows up. First of all, let's talk about location. Houston. Beautiful job in Houston. Uh, didn't matter really who they played, but they had uh, Italy, Ireland, Scotland, and then later here, also Scotland, uh, attendance from 17,000 up to 25,000, which is uh, uh, sort of a record, not really a record, but sort of a record for uh, USA Test Matches, and that one 
was in 2018. So four test matches did really well in Houston. Why? Because the local organization group and the businesses that they worked with uh, and the stadium, all of those things came together very nicely. The right size stadium, a lot of people working hard on the ground. Uh, the other thing is, of course, the uh, opposition. So Ireland does pretty well. Ireland gets a, a nice buzz there. Uh, New Jersey, 22,000. And of course, the All Blacks. So we see the All Blacks playing up here. Uh, New Zealand Maori did pretty well as well. But uh, the All Blacks, USA, 61,000. And of course, New Zealand against Ireland at Soldier Field was 62,000 and change. So we know that Ireland, New Zealand, they draw fans. Uh, the game with uh, Ireland and Italy, not so much. USA versus Australia at Soldier Field, not so much. It's a different deal. So opposition has something to do with it. And that was part of USA Rugby's problem. Because when they didn't have a big event and said, we're going to put everything behind this USA Ireland game or whichever game we're talking about, they ended up just kind of half-assing it. These are all things like Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, Canada. Games that USA Rugby didn't anticipate being big draws. So what they did was they, they picked probably an appropriate stadium for the most part, uh, trying not to lose money. They would go to uh, the baseball stadium in Round Rock, Texas, just north of Austin, uh, Del Diamond. They would go to Sacramento. They would go, um, they did pretty well with Ireland in Santa Clara, but they would they would go to San Diego. Here's the problem with that. USA Rugby depended on USA Rugby employees who have other things to do to try and promote all of these test matches. They didn't really do it. They didn't have the wherewithal. They didn't have the experience. They were different people pretty much every year. And they, they didn't have the connections. So they were trying to fit all of that in with other things they needed to do. Their budget was low. They didn't invest in it. They didn't invest the time. And so they still lost money. Now, in the old days, way back before when we were talking about that Boxer Stadium stuff, yeah, four or 5,000 people doesn't seem like a lot, but they actually made money because of the venue they had and how sure they were about the uh, fans that they would get. This time around, you'll see that USA Rugby is dropping around the 2,000 mark. Even and, and sometimes they just completely stepped away from it and just used Glendale. Uh, as a place and we've got the, the those are estimated attendances here in Glendale uh, uh, here and also in 2012 because Glendale doesn't really report uh, attendance it's around 3,000 2,000 3,000 3,500 maybe something like that but it was those small ones that USA Rugby had they had someone really dedicated to be an event person just worried about test matches they could have bumped those up to the six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollar, ten thousand person range, and they possibly made some money. These small ones lost money. So, did they make money anywhere? They probably made money in these guys around here, but up here at the big ones, they didn't. And they didn't because of the deals they had to write. They had to promise money to the teams that were coming, New Zealand, New Zealand and Ireland, Italy, all of those things, they had to promise a cut to uh, the, the promotion company, uh, it turned out that USA Rugby generally was not very successful at writing up deals that would get them a big payout and a guaranteed payout, and they would end up losing money. Also in here, South Africa versus Wales, 22000 or so, USA took a bath in that one. So all of this comes down to whether USA Rugby should even worry about this at all. It's pretty clear, first of all, that if they find a location that has a good venue, hard workers on the ground, and then they combine that with some decent opposition, they can get people to go see those games. USC Rugby should not be in the business of trying to organize, uh, facilitate, uh, populate a test match. They should be in business of putting the team on the field there. Because if USA Rugby just got a rights fee, they could walk away from it and say, we had four test matches this year, and we got rights fees of uh, $25,000 for each one. So we got $100,000, and key for an organization that is losing huge amounts of money, 
they wouldn't lose any money there. Now I haven't added in a couple of other things that um, would illustrate this. First of all, of course, the 2018 Rugby World Cup 7s where USA Rugby lost at least $5 million even though they pretty much sold it out. That was bad contracting, that was bad planning, that was a lousy deal from uh, everybody else who was going to make sure that they got theirs. USA Rugby didn't get theirs. And the other thing is that there's been uh, little to no effort in trying to get fans to pay to see the USA Women's 15s team, the uh, age grade teams, under 20s, things like that. And I'm not saying that 10,000 people would pay to go see them. I am saying that maybe 1,000 would, 1,500, 2,000, if you promoted it right. USA Rugby might be able to get a deal with somebody, uh, some promotional organization that, that looks at smaller events and says, can we fill a modest stadium with a bunch of fans who want to go see the USA under 20 men or the under 20 women play or what we're calling the under 23s but the All-American, collegiate All-Americans play, but they still need to hire someone from the outside. This beautiful graph shows that there are a number of factors that affect who goes to see a USA men's 15s test match and some of it is the venue, some of it is the opponent, and certainly some of it is who knows what they're doing uh, throughout this. But one concept through this entire time is that USA Rugby has generally been losing money on hosting Eagles games, and that has to stop. I'm Alex Goff, and I'm editor of GoffRugbyReport.com, and we cover American rugby, mostly college and high school, and the national teams, but also USA Rugby, also some bigger issues. Check us out and follow us on social media and also on YouTube. Thanks a lot.